Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Asai Calderon Muñiz. <laughs> that's my uh that's my judo noises um i've never done judo asterisk after this um i just imagine that it all sounds like grunting but uh you you might be wondering wait what what is what is going on what is phil talking about today we're talking about mcat judo and this is something that i just want to kind of start with a little bit of okay i guess this is the second asterisk we're going to start with the second asterisk now um the stuff we're going to talk about today is not things that I consider like MCAT 101. This is some higher level things that I always tell students like this is like MCAT 411 or 510. This is upper level stuff when it comes to the MCAT 511. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I am not familiar with the numbers. I just know bigger numbers means upper level <laughs> stuff. But looking at Looking at this, I think that this is one of the things I know that this is one of the things we talk about in the course. And I think that this is one of those things that can help a student kind of like push from, you know, like uh like in that last little bit towards, you know, like trying to scrape out an extra two points, three points um, as they're getting closer to their test day. And so this is something that I think is a high level technique that is probably not something that students need to start with. But um you know, I, we talk about this in the course all the time, as well as a bunch of other strategies for dealing with questions. And I figured, you know what, we should talk about this in the podcast because it's interesting. And I think it's it's actually something that I think students underappreciate um, until they learn it. And then all of a sudden, oh, my gosh, this makes things a whole lot easier. Yeah, they just can't get enough. When when you said, I realized now when you were saying like 411, you meant classes. I yeah. totally thought you meant MCAT scores. I was like, no, no, no we're not sending students. No, we're like not MCAT 101, out. MCAT, yeah, higher level, well, yeah. But I think that goes to like the the way that, you know, we think about this. It's that it's not for someone who's like, you know, in the 490s and trying to fine tune. This is something you still need a lot of the foundational content and strategy that mm -hmm. we, we talk about both in the podcast and in the course in order to get your score up to a point where you're fine tuning your score and getting those extra, like you said, scraping, you know, two, three extra points there. Um, and so it, I, I really want to emphasize that because if, if you go into today's podcast and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to like do that for every single question, but then you don't still target your content and basic strategy, you're not going to reap the benefits of this the same way. Yeah, um, for sure. So, this, I, I like that I, I've had these, these thoughts when, when we were talking through it before, and I never compared it to judo in my head, but I really love the way you do this. I did taekwondo for a little bit. Um, I don't know if, <laughs> if I had mentioned that before or not. I don't but, think so. Uh, the idea in, in judo is that there, you can have someone that would be a very different weight class or size, someone who's much larger, and you can still defeat them. How? by using their weight against them. So with the MCAT, it is this mammoth <laughs> of an exam, a mammoth beast. And so we're going to use its size and their techniques, what we know about it against them, essentially at the level of the questions. And so what we're going to be going through is how do we approach not just questions, but really answer choices in a way that by knowing what the test writers have written, but also some tendencies that they have when making answer choices in order to help ourselves with this exam that is, to some extent, a game of statistics, right? Because if you can narrow down answer choices, you're more likely to do well. And so at the end of the day, it comes back to, can you narrow down answer choices, even if you don't know the exact answer from the beginning? Yeah, a little bit of, of context. I always try to compare this to boxing, right? Like in boxing, if you weigh 150 pounds and your opponent is 250 pounds of muscle, you've lost, right? Yes. Like you can't, you can't win that boxing match. Um, I would bet against winning that one. However, in judo, you use, like you said, your opponent's weight against themselves. So being outmatched is not as big of a deal in judo. Um, and I don't really want to use the term outmatched, but like using your opponent's weight against themselves is a tool you can do. And that's what I like. That's how I think about this is we're using the exam against itself. Um, as a little bit of context, 
Oh, man, this makes me feel super old. Um, <laughs> when the third practice test from the AAMC came out, oh, this, no. was, this was a long time ago, um, I sat down and I took the exam, but specifically I did the cars section. And what I did as I went through there is I actually was trying to like help me myself fine tune this understanding of the the answer choices and how to break this this down. And so I did all of the cars questions without reading the cars passages. And this is not something I would recommend any student do ever. This yeah. is not a good strategy. This is not a thing. But I would just wanted to spend some time try, trying to understand questions and the way they're structured. And so what happened is without reading any of the passages, I got half of the questions correct, which is not a good MCAT score. But <laughs> if you look at the fact that I was getting like 50%, so I was pretty much a 50-50 on every single question. But even though like there were four answer choices, so you're able to kind of like fine tune this and and like eliminate like half of the answer choices pretty much every single time, um, at least on average, talking about an aggregate. Um, and there's some things you can do. This also works for the sciences. And I talk about this in the sciences as well as just trying to understand how the questions are written. And so there's three different techniques that we're going to kind of talk about specifically with the answer choices, like using the answer choices. Like if they give me these answer choices, I know these are wrong, or it's probably one of these two, or this one has to be wrong. And so we're going to talk about these. And the first one, and this seems kind of obvious, like if you think about it, but a lot of students aren't looking for these things when they're taking tests. So the first one is if you have two answers that say the same thing, they cannot be correct. Both of them have to be wrong because you have to have three wrong answers and one correct answer. So if you have two answers that say the exact same thing, you can eliminate both of them because you can't have two correct answers. And so this does happen in cars, but also happens in sciences. Um, so there, there are questions. All the examples I'm going to give you today are based off of an AAMC practice question, like stuff that the AAMC has released, like practice exams they've released or other practice materials. And I know that they have one question where they talk about, um, they're talking about, like, doesn't even matter, right? Like, it literally doesn't even matter what the question is. <laughs> but if you look at the four answer choices, right, three of the answer choices are, one of them says, this cell has more mitochondria. One of the answers says, this cell requires more oxygen. One of the answers says, this cell requires, uh, has a greater blood supply. All three of those things are saying the same thing. If you have more mitochondria, you need more oxygen. And if you need more oxygen, you need more blood to bring oxygen to that tissue. And so this is actually a question from the AAMC. And like, even if you don't read the question and you don't read the passage, don't look at any of the data, if you have four answer choices and those are three of them, you can eliminate them all because they're all saying the exact same thing because any tissue that has more mitochondria needs more oxygen that needs more blood and so that is just something that you can immediately eliminate going through there and that feels really good right to be able to look like ignore the question ignore the passage the answer is d right because the other three answers you can just immediately eliminate based on the answers themselves yeah, and that's really, that's huge, right? You're not always going to get a question with three answers that are saying the same thing, but it's not infrequent to get an, a, a question with, you know, two answers that say the same thing or are saying very similar things. And so it's helpful in the sciences. It can also be helpful in cars. So, and this is where we want to be very careful because some saying that things are exactly the same is a little tougher in cars. Um, mm -hmm. But if, you know, if the author or if an answer choice, excuse me, says something about, you know, uh, a particular um, style being ineffective or that it, you know, the other answer choice says something along the lines of um, it doesn't produce its intended effect. Those are essentially the same thing, right? Because if it's not doing what it's meant to do or what it wants to do, then it's being ineffective at what it's doing. So you, this is another instance where you can get rid of both of those answer choices, right? Now, I know sometimes students get concerned because they're like, well, I'm, I don't have great vocabulary. English is my second, my third, my fourth language. How do I go about doing this? And that's something that I hear all the time at free trial sessions. We talk about it in the course and office hours when students have concerns. Um, sometimes it comes up in our CARS workshops if students are like, well, I don't know the, the vocabulary. 
And, you know, we, we tell students this all the time, you're still responsible for any vocabulary in the question stem and the answer choices. And that may mean that you need to do a little bit of vocab refreshing um, and pick up an SAT book, right? Or something like that. Maybe don't try and read an SAT book from cover to cover. <laughs> but, um, you know, you want to be able to have that kind of basic understanding of, are these, these two things similar enough to get rid of them or not? And so that doesn't mean that you have to be the world's leading expert on any given topic and know every single word associated with it. But you just want to have enough that you can find these similarities when they come up and not let them um, not let them overwhelm you. Yeah, I feel like this is this like first one is probably more useful in the sciences than than the car (laughs) stuff, because you know a lot of outside knowledge. And so things like that, you can kind of like link up together because Mm -hmm. I know about mitochondria, I know about oxygen and blood and like the point of all of these things and how they work together. Um, I I feel like often I'll see this with like metabolism stuff because I know students are a little sketchy on metabolism. There'll be something about like, oh, you'll have increased glycogenesis and you'll have increased um, uh, gluconeogenesis or decreased gluconeogenesis. And like, if you understand like zoomed out, like, oh, is my body starving or am, do I have plenty of f- fuel? Like what, and if I'm starving, all of these are true. If I have plenty of fuel, all of these are true. And so you can kind of like, if they say like a couple of these that kind of all happen when you're starving, if one of those is happening, the other ones are probably happening as well. And so you can kind of like eliminate that if you have like two answers, like, you're breaking down glycogen and you're building glucose with gluconeogenesis. Those are going to happen at the same time. And so you can just look at that and be like, oh, if those are both answer choices. I'm going to eliminate them because it doesn't make sense for one of them to be happening and not the other. I love that you brought up that example. One of my favorite things to do is just honestly, I would I would have my students just ask, OK, is it fed state or fasting state? And mm-hmm. list what would happen in each of those states. And guess what? Um this, these things never, especially metabolism, never fully goes away, even when you are, you know, in medical school and beyond. And it was, I was reviewing a Hatsa for the exam that I'm I'm going to take, um, like the TCA cycles on there, right? I'm not fussing about the TCA cycle, but and I was watching the the video and, you know, just have my, my notepad in case there's anything else. And they were going through laboriously explaining why a change in ATP or citrate would influence the TCA cycle. But if you pause and you just think, what are those markers of? Mm -hmm. I have high levels of ATP. What's that a marker of? If I have high levels of citrate, what's that a marker of? So I, for the students listening, hopefully you're going to, if you don't know exactly right away, you're going to go head over and and review the TCA cycle. Um, But the idea is that if you know what's happening upstream, downstream, you have an idea of what answer choices are going to be similar. Right. Yeah. And so it, this is like if you can learn the information that interconnected, it's going to stick. It's going to make the MCAT easier. Right. With all these answer choices. But it's also going to make your ability to find those connections stronger and you're going to do better in med school as well. So just throwing yeah. that out there. I, I feel like I should have known. Like, I, I know, like, you know, you get your big test coming up here very shortly. Um, and like, I should have known like, oh, if I mentioned metabolism immediately, her, she, her brain's going to start firing and connecting things. Um, metabolic disorders was definitely one of my least favorite things in med school. Um, but, uh, so, so I'm not like I, you have my, uh, sympathy for, for you. Um, well, that's just, hopefully it convinces students to pay attention to the TCA cycle and metabolism. Um, yeah. But so we've talked about answer choices that are essentially saying the same thing, right? And neither of those can be true because if they are saying the same thing, they cannot answer the question. On the flip side, you have answer choices that say opposite things. And there are two kind of important things to consider here. The first is that if they're opposite, chances are one of them will be correct. Unlike what we just talked about with the answer choices being the same, that doesn't mean that one of them has to be correct. So Mm -hmm. it's an increased likelihood, but not an absolute. So we can't get rid of um, both or we can't necessarily just get rid of one and assume immediately that the other answer choice is going to be correct. Yeah, that's a good that's a good kind of like thing. So like with one, like if two answers say the same things that you have to eliminate them. And it's definitive. Mm -hmm. This is more just a general trend. 
Yeah, um, exactly. And I think one of the things that I always found interesting when it would happen is you can also have two sets of opposite answer choices in a given question. Again, this is um, this in particular is very uncommon. But in that case, you can say, okay, if I know which of which set doesn't apply, then I know that of the two that are left, the the second opposite set, one of them has to be correct, right? And the other one has to be incorrect. And so this is where without and again this is this is generalized um so without going into too many details right if one of the answer choices says that something is effortless and the other answer choice says that something was requiring work on on some person's behalf <laughs> um then you can say okay one of these is probably wrong if i can figure out which one's wrong i've increased my likelihood of getting that question correct and again it's not it won't it's not an absolute but you've increased your chances and at the end of the day that's like i said earlier it's a lot of what the mcat is if you even if you do not know the exact answer from the beginning if you can increase your odds do it right um the yeah the the one caveat is just like as we mentioned um so those are the two big things opposite yeah. increased likelihood doesn't have to be one of those two and you can get two sets of opposites. It, it kind of depends on the question mm -hmm. a ton because um, one thing, like I know you said, like if you have two things saying opposites, one of them is likely wrong. I mean, if you have two things that are saying opposites, one of them yeah, one has of them, to be wrong. Sorry, because one of them is likely have, to be the correct answer. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and so if they say like, like, oh, like if I have something that says current goes down or current goes up, right? I know one of those is wrong, right? And so if I know going down is wrong, then it's probably pretty likely it goes up in that case. It doesn't have to be though. Like it could be like, oh, the current doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. Like and that would be a case where current goes up and current goes down are both wrong answers, even though they're opposites of each other. But that that's a case where where that is like it's it's likely one thing or another. But there are also times that we see this where I think this is most useful is when they give you uh, a tough data interpretation passage. Mm. There's all of this like tables of data about this, this protein and kind of like what it does. And I've seen a question from the AMC where they ask like, like it do, once again, it doesn't even really matter what the question is, but like the question is, which of these is going to make you skinny? basically, which of these is going to cause like a deep, like you won't gain as much weight. One answer choice says um, you knock out this protein and you get rid of this protein. And then another answer choice says you have an overexpression of that protein. And like, if you know from the, the table or if you know from, from the passage that this protein is involved in weight gain, then either not having it will make you gain weight or having more of it will make you gain weight. One of those is gonna have to be true. And so it kind of doesn't even matter what the other answer choices are. You can just kind of eliminate those. Like it's gotta be either less of this protein or more of this protein. One of those is gonna make me gain weight or one of them is gonna make me lose weight. And so I think that's when it's most useful when they're trying to get you to interpret data. Um, and then they give you like answer choices that are opposite. And if you know this is somehow connected to weight gain, like one of those two answer choices has to be correct. And like, it doesn't even matter once again what the other answer choices are. Like you can just throw them in the garbage um, because they they can't they can't be correct because it's got to be one of these two. Yeah. Um, I, go I ahead. can also see them asking this in bio biochem with like DNA methylation and demethylation, yeah. right? stop codon and a gain of function versus a, a loss of function mutation. I can see this with enzymes. Um, right. And just because we're on, we're on metabolism. So my brain is on it. Right. Um, some like a kinase versus um, like a phosphatase. Right. And so if you know, if you can, as you're going through your studying, you can learn which, like which uh, pairs of opposites exist in the human body. And even with honestly, even with hormones as well, then you're going to set yourself up for success with this particular judo technique, MCAT judo technique. Because yeah. if you can have those tucked in the back of your mind from a content perspective with the sciences, you're going to have a better chance at being able to apply this one. Yeah. Or if they say like, which one of these is going to make your kidney more active with gluconeogenesis and one is high blood sugar and one's low blood sugar. Like one of those is correct. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that this is something that is really common in the sciences, especially about data interpretation. Um, and I know data interpretation tends to cause students a lot of trouble 
kind of overall. Um, I know we've talked about this a lot, but it's it's kind of unfair the level of data interpretation they expect students to be able to do based in undergrad, like most students are not doing a ton of data interpretation. So, so, so a technique like this that helps you just like eliminate half the answer choices, like I know it's A or B, it's not C or D, that mm-hmm. is that can be really, really useful. Um, sometimes you'll see something that's actually a combination of the both judo techniques where like, A and B say the same thing and B and C say the opposite. (laughs) And so like, okay, I know because B and C are opposite. One of those is true and A and B say the same thing. So neither of those can be true. So I know B is wrong and it's got to be B or C. So the answer is C. And like, once again, it doesn't really matter what the question is. Um, You can still kind of go in there and eliminate that. I do want to talk about that. You did talk about the, the sets of opposites though. Um, where you have like two sets saying the opposite. And that does sometimes happen. Like they might give you a passage about like if you heat up a wire, what's going to happen in like in the circuit. And like one answer choice is the voltage goes up. One says the voltage goes down. One says current goes up. One says current goes down. And like, so you have two sets of things being opposite. So it's it's hard for you to say, well, well it's got to be C or D because they're opposites, but like A and B are also opposites. And so in that sort of scenario, it requires you to have some outside knowledge, like the fact that the voltage is determined by the power source. And so if we heat up the wire, the resistance goes up, but the voltage doesn't change from the power source. And so, so the, those we can eliminate. But if the resistance goes up, the current will drop. And so the answer to that question would be the current's going to drop because when you heat up wires, the resistance goes up and so current drops. Um, but still, so there is sometimes those scenarios where you have two sets of opposites and that requires some outside knowledge of just knowing like, okay, which of these things are related? Um, but I think that this is a really useful technique, which is why we talk about it, right? Like I wouldn't talk about it if I didn't think it was useful. Um, And I think that once you start looking for these, it's a whole lot easier to, like you'll start to notice them everywhere. Um, Like there's a lot of students that have taken exams and I talk about this technique and they're like, I don't think that happens in the exams. I've taken a lot of exams and I'm like, okay, let's, let's go back and look at a test. And then all of a sudden, like we look through just the chem phys section and we find like 20 questions that have some of these techniques. And so like a third of them, right? A little bit more than a third of the questions, like you can get down to a 50-50 by just paying attention to like, do we have answers saying the same thing, answers saying opposite things. And so it starts to click in students' brains like, oh my gosh, this is a lot more useful than I realized. It's just, you have to be on the lookout for it. Yeah, I also, I didn't, I didn't mention this, and and I'm glad I didn't forget to mention this. With respect to cars, um, you can also have a situation where what creates essentially opposite answers is the strength of the vocabulary used. So, for example, if they say sometimes X is true versus um, X is always the case or every time or all, those are essentially opposite answers, right? They're not saying that it never and then always happens. But the strength of it is saying that if it always happens, it can't be that it only sometimes happens, right? Um, If it always happens, then it's not that it sometimes happens. And so that creates this um, set of opposite answers that you can also use to your advantage. And that's something that I'm glad I didn't didn't forget because I know I I almost did. (laughs) Yeah, that's one of those things that like they aren't technically opposites. Mm -hmm. But once again, you know one of them has to be wrong because you have have to have three wrong answers. You can only have one right answer. Mm -hmm. So if you know one of those is wrong, so if it's like, oh, this never happens and this sometimes happens, one of those has to be wrong. So it's probably the other one. Mm -hmm. Um, But once again, there is some wiggle room with this one. (laughs) Um, So they're like the first one where things say the same thing, you can definitively eliminate those. The second one, if things are saying opposites, it's probably one of those two. That's not a definitive thing, but it depends on the question and it's a pretty useful technique still. The third one is is another definitive one. And this is one where the AMC gives what I like to call nested answers, which is if one answer is true, it makes another answer true. If that happens, that first answer has to be wrong. Because you can't have two correct answers. I always feel like this is the more complex one of the two. But if you see something like 
Um, I always like to use this example. Like if there's an answer choice that says Phil has a Great Dane and another answer choice that says Phil has a dog. Like if Phil has a Great Dane, then Phil has a dog. So if Phil has a Great Dane is true, then we have two true answers. We can't have that, right? Like Phil has a Great Dane has to be wrong, right? Because the other answer choice is Phil has a dog. And like, if he has a great day and he has a dog and I can't have two true answers. Now, something to be careful of here is Phil has a dog could still be true, but the Phil has a great day and could be wrong. And so we like, if given those two answer choices, Phil has a great day and Phil has a dog, we have to eliminate Phil has a great day. The other one could still be true. Right. But this is a, a way to like pair up two questions and no, or pair up two answers. And like one of these has to be wrong. And it's this one. And it's not just like there's the thing if you have two things that say opposites, like one of them is has to be wrong, but you don't really know which one it is. But with this one, if you have one answer that if it's true, it makes another one true. That first one is just wrong. It has to be wrong. It doesn't even matter what the question is. It doesn't matter what the passage is about. You'll see these relationships. Um, I feel like the Great Dane and Dog thing is. Like, uh, like that makes a lot of sense to people. That's always why I like to start with that one. The way you see this on the exam is sometimes a little bit trickier. Um, I know there's one of the answers or one of the questions from the AMC that says something like the velocity depends on the mass. And the other one says the time of travel is inversely proportional to the mass. And I'm like, okay, so everything's going the same distance. So if your time of travel is inversely proportional to mass, then like if the mass goes up, your time of travel goes down, right? And so there's a relationship, but that means you must be going faster, right? If I get somewhere faster or in less time, that means I'm going there faster. So if time of travel is inversely related to mass, then yeah, the velocity depends on the mass. And so like time of travel is inversely related means that the other one would be true as well. Velocity does depend on the mass. And so we can eliminate the time of travel as inversely related. Note that in this in these scenarios, these pairings of nested answers, you always have a more vague and a more precise thing. But like Phil has a great dane. That's more precise than Phil has a dog, right? Time of travel is inversely proportional to the mass that's more precise than just the velocity is affected by the mass, right? That's more vague because it doesn't tell you it goes up, goes down. I don't know. It's just, it's just related somehow. And so this is something to be on the lookout for. Um, if you find yourself torn between two answers, I mean, just e even forgetting this relationship, like even forgetting this judo thing, more vague is generally better. Um, because very often the MCAT tries to make a question wrong by making it like distorting it, like making it a little too extreme, for example, right? Or a little bit too just kind of like flipped or something. Um, and this is because the MCAT writers know that we like to be precise, right? And I know I've talked about this a lot. Like we as humans want to be precise. The more precise we are, the more useful that answer is, right? Like if I ask somebody what time, what time is it? And they say it's after the death of George Washington, that does not help me, <laughs> right? Uh, if I ask what day is it? They say, oh, it's, it's, it's a day after 2000, the year 2000, like Y2K. I'm like, okay, that doesn't help me, right? More precise is better. And so we've been trained to be more precise in our responses. And so the AMC will give us a really precise wrong answer knowing that we're going to be tempted by it versus the vague answer, which we kind of don't like doing. And that's kind of like bland and tasteless. Um, I always call those the accountant from Ohio answers because they're, <laughs> they're like not particularly sexy, but they're, they're still good. Right. Like it's still, I mean, like I'm, I'm imagining like dating somebody, like, I don't know if I'm like, Oh, I'm dating this accountant from Ohio. It'll be exciting. Like, no, um, it's not like particularly amazing, but it's still, like, but like can be good and like that sort of thing. And so answers that are vague and a little bit bland and tasteless, that's a way for the AAMC to make a right answer less tempting. And then they'll make the correct or the incorrect answers. They'll make them more precise, more attractive to us, more like spicier. They're more interesting, like mentally to us. And so 
this is something that I kind of noticed like going through these nested answers. You always have a really precise one and a really vague one, but the precise one means the vague one is also true. And yeah, that just apologies can't... to any accountants in Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you may have aged us with that Y2K thing. I don't know if people still, uh, yeah, I think, I think we got aged. Yeah, that a might bit. be a reference. Nobody would be like, what's he talking about? Um, <laughs> But um, this is where cars departs. So this can sometimes be true with cars, but you have to be a lot more careful because this idea of a more precise, specific answer versus more general, you can't just get rid of the more specific one because let's say that the author is talking about, um, they're talking about poems And that's it. The whole passage is about poems. And then one of the answer choices says something along the lines of, oh, like written works versus poems. Chances are that one of those will probably be incorrect. But unless there's a second part that maybe it's like a not question or something like that, the poems one might actually be correct. And the written works one might be incorrect because we didn't talk about any other types of written works. And so with cars, because we have to stick so closely to what's discussed in the passage, it becomes, there's this departure from the sciences. And so with that, be be very careful using this judo technique. Make sure that what is mentioned in the, in the answer choice as a whole for both of those is fully, is like actually discussed in the passage. And then this can be helpful. And so it's, it's essentially making it making sure that this idea is nested somewhere in the passage and then you can use the nesting technique unless right you have a different question type that it wants what's not aligned with the passage right and that's that's a g- really important thing to like focus on the question type as well because yeah. there are certain questions like if they ask like what is the author's main point in paragraph 2 like that's they're asking for a really precise thing and so like they like a more precise answer might actually be closer to the author's main point, right? The author may believe both the more vague one and the more precise one, but the author's main point of that paragraph was the more precise thing. And so in that case, you could have that scenario. However, if they ask a question like, which of these would the author generally agree with? In that case, like I tend to want to go more vague. Like if they say something like, um, people should learn more about poetry versus something that says poetry should be mandatory taught in high schools, right? Like one of those is more vague. Like if, if the author says, yeah, poetry should be mandatorily taught in high schools, then the author thinks people should like be exposed to poetry. And like, it's possible for the author to think people should be exposed to poetry, but not maybe it required in classrooms, right? And so, like, that scenario, it's kind of like the Great Dane dog thing. You have to be kind of careful with the type of question, right? Is it looking for something that generally the author would agree with? Or is it looking for what was the author's argument in paragraph two? In which case, in that second type of question, you can't really use this technique as much, this, like, nested answer thing. Um, I know that we don't talk about question types often in um, in like the podcast format. I know we talk about that way more um, in the course and kind of like understanding the different types of questions. But that's this is one of the reasons that, you know, everything that we're talking about here today is like high level strategy stuff. And like a lot of these things kind of like mesh together. But I feel like this MCAT judo stuff is something that like just being aware of this and being on the lookout for it, you can start to kind of like eliminate answers and figure out things and kind of step back um, from from the question itself, step back from the past and just looking at the the answers. Be like, oh, like B and C are probably wrong. It's probably A or D because B and C are kind of saying the same thing. And I think that those can be really useful techniques to just kind of like fine tune that last that last little bit. Once again, this isn't something that somebody who is just starting the MCAT that I would say, hey, like you need to start practicing MCAT judo week one. Like, no, this is something that the last month before your test, right? Like you need to like start being way more aware of this. Look for these things actively, Um, especially in certain scenarios. Like I said earlier, like data interpretation stuff, especially techniques one and two, um, the like two things saying the same or two things saying the opposite, those happen all the time in the sciences with data interpretation stuff. Um, metabolism, as I mentioned, is another place that I tend to see this a lot because 
people get confused about metabolism and also mm-hmm. hormones, so like seeing things in there as well. And so there's certain places where I think your these techniques are going to be more useful. There's certain places where they're a little bit less useful. And so you want to be aware that these things exist and look for them so you can start to pick them out and start to realize when this is useful and when it isn't. Um, I definitely think when you are like practicing and doing practice questions, anytime you miss a question, but go back and just kind of look and be like, okay, was there like, forget the, the, the topic of the question, that sort of stuff. Was there, were there any clues in the answer choices themselves? Right. And that's, that's really what the whole point of this is. I think a lot of students feel like the clues to getting the right answer is going to come from the passage or my own knowledge. Sometimes the clue comes from the question, and sometimes it comes from the answer choices themselves, the way that they are presented. And that is um, a much higher level thing that most students just don't think about. Yeah. And and that's like, I think, key to what, you know, we've been talking about, the fact that these techniques are standalone in that they don't have to require the passage. They don't have to require, um, or they don't require, there we go, <laughs> the um like any content. That said, part of why implementing this later on in your studying can maximize what you, like the points that you get out of this is because you can combine all of those things. And so these are great standalone. And as you move along, as you learn more content, as you um, hone your general strategies, take advantage of where all of these intersect to maximize the points that you get. <laughs>